the deliberate and conscious relaxation of the physical body does suggest to the rest of our system our thoughts and our feelings and our attitudes does suggest to them that they can relax also so as a first work for yourself right now do make a deliberate and conscious effort at just at physical relaxation and you can start that simply by seeing if maybe some of your muscles are unnecessarily tight or tense do sit comfortably and relax and you might even be surprised to find that this gives you a very minor jolt because you were not aware that you were sitting with a certain amount of, of tension maybe in your hands or maybe even your toes which you're unaware of were tense so do that right now and then we can proceed just just relax it in a conscious effort which is another thing we can practice all day long to continue this interruption of our habitual states which we have discussed so much when we were children we were told quite often by many people about certain virtues which we commonly call the old-fashioned virtues we were told if you can't succeed in a task to keep at it to try it again we were told to be honest about things and when hearing about these virtues as children we accepted them as being good and right and necessary and then as we grew older and all this terrible conditioning began to harden us we forgot all about these old-fashioned elementary virtues the simple virtue of being kindly to another person so we lost them you might say we lost faith in them because the very people who told us about these virtues didn't at all practice them did they you look at society as a whole and you see that society while giving lip service to being honest society is extremely dishonest it is so dishonest that if we saw it all at once it would shock us unbearably and so we forgot all about the common everyday virtues we should have and yet at the very same time that we got away from them there was something very natural and very hounding in each one of us that sensed that sense that they were right after all not as a moral teaching you shouldn't be honest because it's morally right you should be honest because you have no choice but to be honest anytime we have a choice we're divided anytime we can choose to be honest in this case and dishonest in this case we're not honest at all that kind of honesty is self-interest I deceive you when I want something from you because that doesn't make any difference I tell the truth and then pride myself on being an honest human being so there is something in every one of us that senses the rightness of being an honest human being not again as a moral teaching but as part of this original new new as compared to what we have been nature that we have see there is no division in honesty you heard the old saying you can't cheat an honest man that's a fact you really can't you can only cheat a man or woman who has dishonesty in themselves and this is on many levels even on the everyday level you won't be taken by charlatans if you are an honest man but if there's something in you that wants to deceive that man then this man can deceive you you understand this so what we're going to do this morning is take just one of these original virtues 
and this is the final talk in this series and connect it we're all going to work together on this I'm going to start out and then we'll open the discussion we're going to connect this particular virtue with anything and everything we you have learned in any of these classes before perhaps the one last night when you were in smaller groups what we're going to do is take the virtue and that's okay that's all right that's a good word take the virtue of self-reliance synonym would be self-responsibility but let's just stick to self-reliance so we're thinking about one thing at a time and not dividing our minds on that level the power of self-reliance okay we're going to connect this with an idea a thought a method a plan which we have learned not yes not 10 days ago maybe yesterday or today in this morning's class with self-reliance and this new idea so that a new third thought is formed so that we see something new by bringing these two together and I will give you an example if I am really self-reliant or I'll rephrase that if I want to build more self-reliance there are certain things I have to do I have to obviously work on myself and there are endless ways in which I can do this example if around the house sometime uh, I can't find the salt shaker and it should be in this place right there in the kitchen my first impulse would be to ask my husband or wife where's the salt shaker you think this is a little thing you do this instead of calling out hey where's the salt shaker it should be over here you be self-reliant in such a little thing as this which forces you to think which forces you to not mechanically call out hey where's the salt shaker you look around and you find that wherever it is and obviously if you can't find it after a thorough search then you might ask it might be down being repaired if you repair a salt shaker find some small way where you would normally ask for assistance for someone else from someone else and do it yourself you will find you might even have a feeling and probably will have a feeling of discomfort while you're doing this because it's much easier to call out and let someone else do it for you this is a small example and you in your own lives have to find your own do it yourself now we'll take a, a much larger one this is small now a, a large one it is it is tremendous we covered it briefly before I'm connecting also with previous talks in order to build self-reliance I must not I must not demand a single thing from the future I have great plans for this project for being happier for uh, earning money whatever it might be and it doesn't turn out that way and I am disappointed I am disappointed because I am saying the future should conform to what I today have demanded and when it doesn't I'm disappointed and feel that the future has let me down when in truth of course it is myself and my expectation that has let me down and I shouldn't have done it in the first place if I am totally self-reliant in a minute we're going to find out what this self is that we're talking about if I am totally self-reliant listen I am reliant now without any reference to the past or to the future therefore this reliance this real honest reliance asks for nothing outside of itself therefore it cannot be disappointed by anything this is easy to talk about you see if you do this tomorrow if you are disappointed it is because you are not relying on yourself and I'll, we'll get to the self business in a minute because that is tricky so I have to see that total self-reliance does not exist in time at all 
There are no expectations, no demands, not even any regrets of the past. Remember all these horrible things we did in the past? Those can be seen as a fact, but not as an emotional upheaval in the now through guilt or shame or regret or whatever it might be. All right. We have said that we must be self-reliant. Now let's connect this with, with another thought. Who is this self that we're going to rely on? When we, when we start out on these things, we really don't know. We don't understand. We haven't gone very far, so we can't see it. Let's see what self-reliance is not. Authentic self-reliance is not depending upon an idea in my own mind. An idea? I depend on the idea that you should respect me, you should be nice to me, you should do something else for me. This is an idea. I'm depending on an idea of how you should behave, how life should behave toward me. This is not self-reliance at all. This is reliance on thought, which means it's not going to be matched by external happenings out there. But because I have taken this thought as me and think that you owe me something, I'm going to be hurt and disappointed and bitter and so forth. So self-reliance does not properly connect with an idea that I have in my mind, concepts, opinions, attitudes. That is what it is not. Now we'll see what authentic, let's emphasize the word authentic so we can see the difference. Authentic self-reliance is when I am above all thinking about this pseudo self which I have built up and I cease to think about it when I see through the hoax that I do have this separate self. And this, now, this is possibly the most advanced thought we have ever had, so pay attention to this closely because it will go fast. Authentic self-reliance is a thought itself. I must depend. Already, this is thought operating, dividing. I must depend on this. Self-reliance means I am depending on myself. You're using words. The self doesn't exist. So, listen, so when you are authentically self-reliant, the whole idea of self-reliance has no meaning. It disappears. When you say self-reliance, already you're using words and if you're not, if you can do this consciously, it's a different matter. But if you say self-reliance and take this self as someone who can get out and, and make a lot of money and conquer the world, this is a blunder. This is a mistake because there is no such self. To finalize this, it's very complex. Authentic self-reliance is when you don't even think about self-reliance at all. It is not there as an idea is an ideal that you should attain. However, we have to, at the start, use words in order to understand what we're talking about. And that's why we can freely use the idea of self-reliance right now. Have you understood this latter point at all? We'll discuss it later. All right. Uh, I'll tell you what I want you to do. This is the project you will be given for yourself if you want to do it. And please do, after the class and when you're by yourself, do take a piece of paper and write down, I'll explain the whole thing in detail in a minute, but write down at the top of the piece of paper how I can build more self-reliance and then put a lot of numbers underneath that, one, two, three, and so on, as far as you want to go. And you out of your own thinking, you fill out those numbers. Later on, you can comment on this and even say them out loud if you want. How can I build self-reliance? I've given you a couple of, of examples. Force yourself in little everyday things to do things for yourself so that we're not so lazy about it. You'll find a different feeling. 
you breaking this mechanical habit of, hey, where's the salt shaker? Also the idea of relying on our essence rather than on ideas. Fill this page out as much as you can, add to it, and then practice it. You have to actually do these things. Writing it down on a piece of paper is one small step. Then actually work it out, see what you can do. And one other thing. On this little project of writing them down, this time you are not to show it to anyone at all. You're not to show it to your wife, your husband, or anyone else. This is to be strictly and 100% a private project. You may think I'm making a too big a deal out of this. You do this. You keep this to yourself. See, nothing is fixed. There are times when we get together to discuss ideas back and forth. There's also the opposite of that. There are times when you must keep everything to yourself. So you keep this from each of you wives and husbands know the other person is going to do it. Don't you show your list to each other or friends. This is all by yourself. You study that and you work at it. Part of your self-reliance is to not show it to anyone else. Understand? I'll tell you another thing to do with this. When you have got to about five points and your mind is exhausted, keep going. See, we get a lot of mental energy. And we sit down all by ourselves with a coffee cup over there and we write down, write down. And you come to point five. I can't think of anything else. You increase your self-reliance by staying right where you are. Don't you get up and refill the coffee cup. You stay right where you are and force yourself to think. This will bring your memory out properly because whether you know it or not, you have for every of those five ideas, you can think of 95 more if you would sit there and force yourself to do it. See? See how lazy we really are. It's very easy to write five and then stop and say, I have accomplished something. Always, here's a general project. Always push yourself far more than you want to do. Never spare yourself. Never spare yourself anything. You've been given many of these in earlier talks. Find ways where you can make yourself uncomfortable, which will force your mind to yield what it actually has for you. I'm going to stop here and we'll discuss. I would like to um, hear from you, please, and then we'll go on to a little different version. I'd like to hear from you examples of self-reliance. One would be... I can make myself more self-reliant by not depending on a group. Not depending on a group, which does not mean it's wrong to come right. to a group. Right. Yes. Doing my own cooking. Pardon? Doing my own cooking. Doing my own cooking. You might. She may take you up on that. He asked for it. <laughs> Making my own decisions. Making my own decisions. Seeing my own indecision. Seeing my own indecision. Seeing my own indecision would be great self-reliance because you're seeing the state as you are. Doing my own evaluating. Doing my own evaluating. Forcing myself to do something that I've never done before. Good. Into the unfamiliar activity. Switching. Not depending on comfort from others. We had a discussion on that, a very brief discussion on that this morning. <clears throat> and we saw, in connection with this business of comfort, I only know, real, I only realize that I'm in discomfort when my comfort is taken away. Because I was living in a state of dependency not realizing it I've got it made with a beautiful wife and a beautiful income and they fall away and I find out that I wasn't as strong as I thought I was if I had worked on myself I could have had this beautiful wife and beautiful income and not been identified with it therefore if and when reality truth change took it away how could there be a shock? Because I was not getting a sense of self from 
possessing this money and this beautiful woman. This is why you see, you see how you can be a, a millionaire or a, a poor man and it doesn't make a bit of difference? How you, can, you could even be famous or you could be unknown as long as you're not identified with it? What difference does it make? As long as you're not getting a sense of self from it. Rich people often give their way, money away in an attempt to be spiritual. See what a wrong move this is. Does nothing for them. Self uh, two more over here. The lady first, please. Isn't there such a thing as being comfortable in truth? Self-reliant To be comfortable in the truth itself? No, in being too self-reliant. Is there such a thing as being too self Well, all right. It, see, we have a, a word problem. If by too self-relaxed, to me, when you say that, this is what... Self too self-reliant... Well, all right, I, I, I get your point, yeah. A false self-reliance, pride in vanity in saying, I do everything my... Obviously, we're not talking about that. That is not self-reliance anyway. That's just vanity parading as self-reliance. Boy, a uh, few things are more dangerous than to have an image of being an independent person. Nobody tells me what to do, that sort of thing. Everybody tells that man what to do. We're talking about authentic where we're throwing ourselves back on ourselves I'll tell you when you're throwing yourself back on yourself in self-reliance when you are shaken up when you are thrown out of your comfort even just such a small thing as finding that salt shaker for yourself self-reliance is and then we'll go to something else if we have one more uh, yes Larry uh, walking off the end of the diving board with an imaginary dry cement swimming pool out there and then finding it was sweet warm water. I, I don't quite follow that. Would you explain that please? Uh, doing the completely unfamiliar with no knowledge of the reaction till I get there. All right, that's fine. Going into the unfamiliar and then see, look, seeing what is there instead of going into it with a preconceived idea. Is that what you mean? Yes, fine. Because then I'm still traveling in the known, right? I have an idea of what God is going to give me when I die. That is simply my own illusions and my own fear. I haven't been treated nicely here, but God who is love will treat me nicely up there. That's self-deception and a projection of what how God will treat me after I die. Uh, Rudy? Dropping unnecessary desires. Dropping unnecessary desires. May I ask you, how can you tell an unnecessary desire when you see it? It makes you anxious. Sure among other things. We, we sense it, don't we? I've got to have that, but you're also very tense at the time you get it. And then when you get it, you don't want it anymore. Um, all right. Any more on that? We're going on to something else. Yes? Not concerning myself about other people's business. Not, be, Not being concerned about other people's Not being concerned with other people's business. Yes. When our, our own lives don't have anything of value in them, then we become very... Uh, curious about what our neighbor does and about his morals then when we find something worthwhile valuable this falls away does it not you can't waste your time with that nonsense we have we have better things to do with our lives have all of you learned something uh, from the beginning have you got any ideas at all all right you're going to use them now we're sticking with self-reliance and one point before we do. This lady's self-reliance, authentic self-reliance, is the same as this lady's and this gentleman as this gentleman's. It's one thing. Do you see? Do you understand what we said about oneness? She never has a personal authentic self-reliance and I don't and this lady doesn't and this gentleman doesn't. It is all one whole reliance, one thing so complex and it's not even reliance anymore when you're there it's not reliance because it's not a thought anymore it's just a living a dwelling an understanding in the beginning it's all right it's fine it's okay to say we must rely on God truth reality okay that's a stage that is at least telling us we mustn't rely on the crowd to make us happy and secure we must rely on God, truth. 
But when I am in this original state, this essence, reliance disappears. See? There's nothing outside of it. See? So we're not divided in this original self-reliance. The self now, now, if we were reading in a book, the self would have a capital S to it. See the difference? Which is truth. All right, you have learned some things. And you will now fill in some more blanks. Self-reliance connects with... Now I want you to fill in, please, some thought that you have picked up during these classes we have had here. And we'll discuss them a little bit. Because we're taking the idea, it's an idea, of self-reliance with an idea of what I've given you examples self-reliance connects with the idea of and let's see what happens when we bring the two of them together you will see yourself going up well in a different direction at least thought never goes up it goes sideways but sideways helps too so please speak up self-reliance connects with self-study self-study Comment, please, a little bit. Find out what I really am by doing your own self-study instead of coming to a group and sitting here and let others study for you. You mean something like that? I was thinking aloud for you, Rudy. <laughs> I will bring up a. I'll make another connection myself. I'll contribute myself, and it was in Rudy's class last night. The idea, I believe, you brought it up, someone. Uh, how mentally lazy we are. So self-reliance connects with the idea of self-laziness. That is, I simply can't be lazy about it anymore and let my mind continue to run away with me. I have to become in control of my mind. Do you see how we're doing this in many ways by chopping it off when it tries to run away with this? So self-reliance does connect with the idea of self-laziness. That's the simple one. Let's see if we can find some harder ones. All you have to do is say a single word, a single thought, and I will make the connection myself if you don't. Yes? Self-reliance connects with uh, seeing how mechanical and unconscious I usually am. Right. Seeing for myself how I go about as a mechanical man without knowing that I am. Yes. Self-reliance is seeking jolts, shocks. Seeking yes. shocks. Yes. Actively seeking them out to get me out of my state. Very good. Self-reliance is becoming aware of how conditioned I am to time and distance. We covered time a little bit this morning, did we not? I cannot rely on the future at all. Truth, reality does not live in the future. Yes, getting up and trying again, you know, instead of making the further mistake of falling into self-dismay, self-condemnation. Look, it's... Uh, Good. I make a mistake yesterday, any kind of mistake, whether my studies or with another human, any kind of mistake. I make a blunder. I fall into self-dismay. When I do that, I've done the opposite of what I'm trying to do as a work whole. I build the self because dismay dismay is what it's paint it's a awful colored paint that I put all over myself but in order to put this paint of dismay there has to be something to put it on and while there is really nothing there our imagination builds the idea of a self and then I put paint on top of it and it might be even well it might be even pretty paint if I pride myself on doing something and so this builds the idea of a self being there. But you know, inside this little thin layer of paint is nothing. There's nothing back of it. How, how easily we deceive ourselves by putting on this cap uh, labels, names, flatteries. So when I fall in dismay, I'm, I'm just doing the opposite of my aim of waking up, of dissolving the self. 
Self-reliance is not mechanically reacting to external situations. Right. Self-reliance is valuing the work. Self-reliance is valuing the work above all else, right? Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Self-reliance is uncritical self-observation. Uncritical self-observation. See how this connects with what was just said here? I make a mistake. I criticize me. And I believe you brought this out last night, and that was a good point. That when I criticize, the criticism I have of me in itself is a single thing. So if I criticize me, I will have this criticism of you, not maybe spoken, but as an attitude toward you. It has to express itself both in and out, this criticism. So as I dissolve self-criticism, how strange that I start to think differently toward you and I don't become so harsh and critical of you, either silently or openly, because this one criticism, having been canceled here, must also be canceled out there. Because it was one thing to begin with. Again, do you see where we come back to true morality, to true love? If I don't hate me, I cannot possibly hate you. If I hate me, I hate you. And the idea, and hate itself, is an idea only. Do you see, do you see that ideas are the problem? One way to put it, that ideas about me are the problem? And if we can see that it's not, that it is an idea and not a reality, then that makes it much easier for us to just drop it because we've already seen that we can drop thoughts. Just drop them. Let it go. Not, not go along with it. Rise up in rebellion against it. Then the idea drops. What was the idea about? The idea that you owe me something. Of course, I don't owe you anything. You always owe me something. That's the way it works, isn't it? I have no responsibility toward you. you. You just have responsibility toward me. Okay. Self-reliance is doing what we fear to do. Doing what we fear to do. Again, what the false sense of self fears to do because it knows it's going to be destroyed. Remember we said that when you start to work, the, the devil rises up in wrathful protest against it because it, it, it senses the beginning of the end of itself, which indeed it is if we keep going at it, which is why we have to keep in our rightful rebellion. This is a sure sign, if, if you're really doing it, not deceiving yourself about it, a sure sign that you're making progress is that you get more shocked at yourself. You hear more screams. You get more confused than you were before. You always were. You just didn't see it. That was part of the illusory blanket we had over our, our eyes that we never saw how confused we were. And it was all a big bluff, wasn't it? All this positive talking, all this telling people what, what our firm opinions on. I'm a man of firm convictions. And you know better than to contradict him if he's too strong in that because you know he's going to fight with you. He's going to argue. You sense it. So you keep your mouth shut. You know, we, we do this all the time. We see people like that, and then we maybe see it in ourselves. Self-reliance connects with... Self-responsibility. Self-responsibility. They're almost synonyms, are they not? Self-reliance means connects when I see that I don't possess a separate identity from the whole. Self-reliance means that I'm not depending on this illusory... Listen to this. That's good. Not depending on this illusory self to carry me through. Because I sense there's something in... You know, there's something in me knows what a, what a faker I am. So I'm relying on this illusory self to carry me through the day, but I, I know it isn't adequate because the demands that the illusory self has are going to be opposed by her demands and his demands. Now I'm in a fight. So there's something wrong, but I don't know any other way to go about it. So I have to find out the whole story. Where I'm making my mistake, then as the illusory self dies, it no longer makes demands on anyone on earth, which means that other people can come into your life 
If they come in your life, you handle them properly. And if they want to go out of your life, so what? What's the problem? There's no illusory self that says that you have to treat me this way. You must stay with me, for example. If you want to leave me, it's you, it's your life. I have my own business to take care of. I will ask you a question. And you can connect this with what we've said earlier. See if you can answer this, either out loud or to yourself. Out loud would be best. You are truly self-reliant when you never even think about whether you are self-reliant or not. Do you understand this or not? You're really self-reliant when you don't even think about the term. If I think about the term, comment anyone? If I think about the term self-reliance, I am thinking about it. All thought has an opposite. Therefore, if I say I must be self-reliant, I'm fearful that I won't be. So I am trapped. This is not contradictory to what we're talking about. It's so To even think about being self-reliant is going to produce an opposite, and I'll be afraid that I'm not self-reliant. But you have to start with this. Then when I've made early progress, finding the salt shaker for myself, cooking my own dinner, I've done all these things, I have built a base, a foundation for going on further to see that the whole idea of self-reliance is an idea. And we've found out that there is a way to live without ideas except where they must be. I have to have an idea that I better get a ladder to pick the oranges on that tree out there. That's an idea. I have to have that to get the oranges, which is okay. But we have found out that ideas are one part of our whole mind. So, to be really self-reliant, I have to go beyond this part of the mind that has ideas. And live in another state which is understanding awareness consciousness which includes ideas alternating with understanding with seeing so when i live this way the whole is self-reliance yours 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 and mine and not divided as to ideas of your reliance or mine it is one thing then I understand with my mind both sides at once the fact that authentic self-reliance is living with the whole mind but also on the level of thought I must be reliant in everyday things I must drive my own car I can't hire someone to drive it for me and maybe I don't even have a car do you understand So, see, truth with a capital T does not think at all about self-reliance. Because if it did, it would mean, I mean a need to find self-reliance. Truth does not need anything. It is, see? So when I'm in this truth by living with my whole self, my whole mind, then I am self-reliance. But now, this self has a capital S, the whole, the all. See, we've gone from salt shakers to God, and they're all connected. I think it was Buddha who gave the illustration that if you want to cross a river, you have to have a raft. You get on the raft, and you cross the river on the raft, You'd be very foolish to put the raft on your back and carry it with you for the rest of your journey. You leave the raft after it has served its purpose. We're using thoughts and words and ideas to serve a certain purpose to get across the river. And then we drop it, except for when we need to think about picking oranges. So thoughts are vehicles for getting us to a certain state where we can leave thought behind except where it is necessary. And the other time, we're simply in a state of consciousness, of understanding, of seeing things.
All right. Self-reliance connects with Yes. Getting rid of fear. Fear is thought. When you're frightened, it's because you're thinking. When you know how to end thought, you know how to end fear. Look how simple it is. Look. And it connects with feelings too. But when one goes, the other goes. They're connected. I am afraid because I think wrongly. When I learn how to think rightly, to pick oranges only, and then not think about I should become a spiritual person, I should become a wife because I'm single or whatever. If I don't think about that, how can there be fear? There's nothing for me to say I must have. When I say I must have, I must achieve, I've divided from truth with a capital T, S, a cap, a tr uh, self with a capital S. I'm divided. Truth is not divided. How do, how do I get to this stage uh, of, of being one with myself through all these things we're talking about and much more? This is why as we progress, fear indeed does fade more and more and more. And you'll see things that you uh, used to be afraid of that uh, you're no longer afraid of. I'll give you an example, a personal one. I mentioned it before in one of our other classes where I, I was working on myself. And uh, I took my car to the garage there in Boulder City. Uh, the brakes were out. So I took it down and uh, all the, the moment I drove in there, I was working on myself, maybe even driving consciously into the station, pulling the handbrake on, which is all the car I had at the time. On the practical level, I didn't want the car to roll down the hill. And getting out of the car and working on myself very hard all the time. And most of us are so conditioned to be afraid of charges. The car charges, the mechanic charges you so much, the plumber comes for 10 minutes and charges you $50 and all that. We have to get right down to earth on this thing so that you and I are not slaves to charges. Whatever it is, you're not going to change that. You're not going to change the exterior world. You can change the way you react to these charges. Okay, so the man, uh, the mechanic, looked around, walked around the car a little bit, picked up the hood and looked it over kind of silently. All this time, I was observing him and I was observing my own reactions. Now, you're following this because this happens to you all the time in one way or another. So, working on myself, I was watching my own reactions to all this and a number of years ago, I would have been uh, standing there in fear and trembling for his grand announcement, see, what they was going to charge. So this time, the blow, in quote marks, came in the form of two words. You'll, you'll know exactly what I mean when I say this. He's walking around the car and he finally came to a certain place and he stood back a little bit and he eyed it and he said, Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, I will give you a testimonial. I have conquered the great, oh, oh. <laughs> At the time, you, you know, I don't have to explain. At the time he said, oh, oh, I was watching myself and I will tell you that I was totally free of all the conditioned reactions that I might have had years ago. Because, you know, the oh, oh says, oh, oh, 200 bucks. <laughs> you work hard on yourself to free yourself of the great terror of the oh, oh. If you're not awake at the time you hear these words, you're sunk. You're captured, right? Now you're afraid. Now you're resentful. You, you, and, you, and you'll say, what right, among a thousand other things, depending on your conditioning, what kind of a social system is this where I can go in and my car has 10 minutes of work on it and that man can charge me 200 bucks? See, I'm bitter and all that. But I don't say anything to him because, I, for one thing, I, nothing can be done about it. You really, there's nothing you can really, very little. It might be some little thing. Go to another garage. And you should do that if you can. Use your mind properly on that level. The thing is, I will tell you, you rise up in wrath. Sorry, I'm going to say this in two ways. Sorry, I am not going to be your slave anymore. I don't care how much you charge me. For, so, no, out. 
Then I go on from there and I see that it wasn't him at all. He's a mechanical man. This is the way he makes money. And, and he's unconsciously thinking, oh boy, 200 bucks, all unconscious to him. But I'm not going to be a slave to my unconscious reactions of fear anymore. This is what we're getting at. I'm not going to live that way anymore. You understand? See, see how you have to be wide awake every second? Right? Right now, as you're sitting here, afterward, every second. All right, let's have general discussion from this point on. And if you can, be self-reliant and centered around the thought of self-reliance. Can you bring in some kind of connection to yourself? I don't want to say the sentence and then have you tack something onto it anymore. We've done that. What about a general discussion from this point on about the idea of depending on myself and not unconsciously depending on other people, which will lead to bitterness and hostility because I depend on you. You never give me a, what I deserve. You never give me enough. Did I see a hand, Bob? Dropping desires that I formerly thought were necessities. Why not comment on that, Bob? Well, it's so easy to think that, uh, gosh, I've got to have this new friend or I've got to have this situation in business happen. And it really doesn't matter whether it works out the way that my little desires want it, in the long run, it really doesn't make that much difference. It doesn't make any difference at all, really, once we finally see it. It doesn't make any... That, that cannot contribute to truth here. That cannot give it, right? Therefore, whatever way it turns out doesn't make... It really doesn't make any difference at all. It may on a physical level, but we're not talking about that. Yes. How about the idea of that self-reliance connects with real joy and happiness? Do you want to comment, or would someone else like to comment? Well, I'd like to make one thought because once in a while it, it has come up that it seems like you know what we're into this kind of thing work is, is very heavy sometimes too. I don't see it that way at all. To me, it's it's a it's a lifting of burdens. Oh yeah. It may yeah. appear at times we're working yeah. on things that we get you know what we call. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's, it really is the only way to get rid of it. How many of you could ever really go back to your old ways? You really can't, can you? You've seen enough already, just what little we've seen, we've seen it. Yes. That, isn't it a real pleasure? You know, we, we use words, but it's a real pleasure to work on this. It's a lot of fun. What great fun. The, the other came to an end, the fun of the night out or the promotion at work, that came, the pleasure of that came to an end. There's no end to this. Yes, I saw his hand somewhere. Learning to drop it. Learning to drop it. Yeah, drop the whole thing. So, I would like to drop the uh oh but as yet I've been unable to. I was on the other end of the stick for many years. I was the one just, oh, me. I wonder how many people I affect in the same way. Dropping it is a key phrase. See, see how much difficulty it is first. Then you'll be able to succeed in it. Uh, Self-reliance connects with not living, not depending on labels. Give us a little comment on that, please. All right. If I depend on labels, if I depend on someone seeing how great, how generous, how whatever it is I am, then I'm depending on them building images mm. of me and if I do the same to another, I am building images of that person. Do you see? Look at the connection. She, she called it labels. A minute ago, I called it ideas. Same thing. Mm -hmm. See? Depending on ideas is the same thing as depending on labels. Depending on words. Look how, look how society uses words to further the illusion that men are sane, that men are conscious. Giving labels, I don't want to mention any specifically, but labels in front of their name on a printed business card, or uh, they're called the honorable so-and-so. See, all these labels contribute to the illusion that it is real, that they are honorable men and women. You're only honorable if you have first seen how dishonorable you really are, or I am. You get to the point, and you, I'm sure some of you already do, where if you see a, 
all these illusions and these fantasies on television they become so easily recognizable to you that you don't even think about them anymore you just see them and forget about them they're so so frequent every word self-reliance yes Self-reliance connects with knowing that I cannot do. Can any of, if you can't, I will comment, but can you, any of you see a connection between what she just said and something that was said earlier? We'll go into it a little bit. She said, self-reliance connects with the thought that I cannot do, which is a fact. I must be so self-reliant that I work on all these things until I see that there is nothing to do except see. Seeing is the only doing. But doing in order to achieve something is an illusion because I'm divided. When I get married, when I get unmarried, when I get the new home, when I get this or that, when I get the flattery, the compliments, then I will feel better, I will feel like someone, I will like it, I will feel more friendly toward people and all that. This is division. I cannot, in one explanation, I cannot do anything but see. That I can do. The word do is a word itself. And I do this by all these studies put together. And I cease doing anything for myself or against myself because I saw the whole thing was based on the illusion that there is a self to do something for or against. That's why you can't... If this lady is free, she, there's no way she can hurt this gentleman who's also free. Nothing. There's no opposites between them. Boy... You and I try not doing something to affirm ourselves and see what a shock that gives us. Because all our lives we've been doing the exact opposite. Remember said we were running 15 miles an hour down the road and bang, we get the sudden realization that it's a, the wrong direction, a wrong move. You watch that momentum that you've built up continue to carry you but we're on to it at last. We at last understand on the level of thought that we have to stop. And when we've stopped, we see that we finally see what we never really saw before, that getting what we thought would fulfill us wouldn't have done it at all because this was something exterior, something opposite. Getting the, the new wife, the new home, would have done absolutely nothing for us. So we have to sit quietly and wonder what on earth we're trying to get. Okay. Did you want to make more comment on that particular thought? Uh, yes, over here. Please. Well, last uh, night, uh, Sally shared with our group this idea of changing our mechanical, fast talking to a process of slowing down and and I connected, I'm getting a good connection, I think, with that and the salt shaker idea and God. And also I'm connecting now something, I don't know how many have read John Livingston Seagull, but in there, a similar thing comes up where he says you've got to start with low level flying before you can be up here and really see what it's all about. I think it's important that we have this uh, connection because sometimes we lose sight of why we're doing these seemingly little nonsense things that our mind might say or not. I can see a real connection. Yeah, yeah. We have to start, as you just I'm just repeating what you said, start with the very fundamental things, eat simple things, find one. Uh, you're at a cafe somewhere and the waitress brings you the wrong dinner. What is going to be your, your reaction to that? Are you going to be in charge of yourself or is that plate of ham and eggs going to be in charge of you? See, you asked for sausage and eggs and she brought you ham and eggs. And, and, and that plate becomes your master. 
or mine. If I react, I told, I definitely told her I wanted sausage and eggs. Why are people like that? See, you're gone. You're a slave. Having looked at that plate consciously, then you might, this is where individual decision comes in, you might say, could you please exchange this for ham instead of sausage? That's up. That part is it. You've done the first thing right. And if she says, no, I can't, go on further. Okay, so you'll have the sausage instead. You're not going to be bitter about anything. If she brought you an empty plate, then you tell her, please fill the plate. <laughs> <coughs> yes. In our group last night, Cupid came up. He was so critical of everything, he found he was criticizing a plant because it wasn't as good a condition as another plant. You know, I'm sorry, I really didn't catch that thought. He said that he found in the past that he had become so critical or hypercritical of everything and everybody. He was even criticizing a plant. One the plant? Six, yeah, I see. Uh, 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 yeah. See, when we've got this criticism in us, it doesn't care who it strikes. It doesn't care. Like shotgun, bang. By the way, connect this thought. Someone is rude to you, to something sharp to you. Don't you realize that you're not the center of his attention. He's going to do that to someone else. Why take it egotistically even to think that he was rude to you? He's rude to everyone. He just is nicely rude to everyone beside you. But we always self-center everything, make ourselves the center of the incident. Yes? Self-reliance is connected with patience and persistence. Patience and persistence. Very good. We do indeed have to be patient with ourselves, which connects with not condemning ourselves. Yes? Uh, Self-reliance connects with following my own inner intuition. Following my own intuition okay fine see the intuition in its real sense being the essence the kingdom of heaven within yes indeed and you know what an astonishing discovery we finally make that we were right after all society was not right after all we thought they were but we didn't know we just didn't know that little intuition that little sensing was right after all but it was so overwhelmed it took us all these years to find out that it was. Isn't that, a, isn't that a tremendous pleasurable thought that indeed everyone, everyone without exception in this room has this small sleeping essence which we're trying to jolt awake. Doesn't that make you feel rightly pleasurable? And you see it waking up a little bit more every day, don't you? Every day a little bit more so that you're not the slave to the car mechanic or the ham and eggs. And that was merely the trigger. The ham and eggs was the trigger. The dynamite was up here all the time ready to explode, wasn't it? And if it wasn't that, it would be something else. It's and recognizing cruelty within ourselves so we don't condemn it when we see it a yeah. little bit of it in others. Yes, I'll repeat that for the tape. Recognizing cruelty in ourselves and not condemning it in ourselves or in others. Yes, again, the idea of, of non-critical self-judgment. If I do indeed see cruelty, I behave cruelly an hour ago towards someone. And if I condemn me, I'm still identified a me there, which perpetuates it. So I will be cruel an hour from now, not only to another person, but to me, because I'm suffering from my own cruelty. So I drop it, I drop the idea of me even being a cruel person. You see, I can't be anyone at all. I can neither be cruel nor kindly. Both are labels. Both are ideas. So I go beyond the ideas of being either cruel or kindly, and I find something that is one, indivisible, that is not divided into a cruel person who should become a kindly person. I'm still trying to do. I have to see this, then I've done it. So I cannot possibly condemn anything. You, I can't condemn you, or me. I can't condemn this mad society, this sick society, which it is. You understand? I can see it, but I can't condemn it. Because that would mean I'm projecting. You see it quite clearly. And you're no longer a part of it. You're standing a part of it. 
and seeing the cruelty, just as we worked so hard on ourselves so that we could stand aside and see our own cruelty without condemning it in order to understand it. Because condemnation is an idea, a label, therefore it stands in the way of something higher than the label, which is the whole mind. Because self-condemnation means I'm living from a little corner of my mind and I'm a competitor with you and with you and I'm in a terrible state now because now I have to please you in order to keep this image going that I'm a nice, deserving, worthy person. And if you leave me, what will happen to me? See, I'm living in an idea, I, hundreds of them, ideas. I'm not living from ideas of even being a kind person or a, a cruel person. I am free. Then, then, I am kind with a capital K, which is not personalized at all. It's the same one kindness that this lady has because she has found herself, or this gentleman because he's found himself. See, if I'm trying to be kind, I'm cruel because I haven't found myself. When I no longer try to do, I am, which means I'm above the thoughts of kindness or cruelty. I and my Father are one. This is what this means. I'm in union with truth. I'm not divided. I'm not fragmented. I see it and I feel it and I live it. Having freed myself, I'm free from everything else, including the plate of ham and eggs. Now I behave decently. Because I'm not afraid. I behave hostily, cruelly, because I'm afraid. Right? Right. Okay? Any general comments from this point on? And you can, if you like, if you like, bring up something in your class last night. Would you like, anyone like to comment on that? Bring something up, a point you learned, something that was helpful, anything at all from this point on. I'll bring up one that helped me a lot in our class last night. Uh, when you begin to work, uh, resistance increases so much. It's uh, very easy to get discouraged unless you uh, expect a great deal of resistance that you'll have that to work against. As long as we aren't working, we, there is no resistance. Right. 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 The devil jumps up when you try to wake up. And he starts screaming, and you can hear him too. That's a sign of waking up. That's right. And if we weren't disturbed at our group last night, we were not working. If they had given you a little jolt, I don't know how much jolts were given to anyone, major or minor. Why are you smiling, Rudy? Did you give somebody a jolt? <laughs> Say that again so we can all hear it. You understand this. You understand this, that these four people were given work projects to lead this class, don't you? And I'll tell you, the fact that, see, Rudy could have got out of it because he had to work, but he got a bus and came all the way down by himself on a bus. I'm not flattering him, I'm just pointing this out. So all these people who have done this, these four, have that much more, see? Maybe they were afraid of some of you people sitting out there kind of sternly and not responding and half dead out there. You know, you're looking at your face and you're bored. I don't know whether you were or not. You look at your own facial expression. They had to take that and not be influenced by your facial expressions for one thing. I, I will tell you, I will now tell all the secrets. I'll let it out. We discussed this before, then we'll go on. We discussed this a little bit, and I told them you might run into all kinds of things. Just, just see what you do run into. You might run into an awful blabbermouth who just tries to take over the meeting. You handle that properly. And if necessary, you be a little bit firm. I don't know. We don't know what we're going to run into. We didn't know how it was going to be divided in any way at all, and that's unimportant. 
and the next time if we ever do it again it'd be divided into different ways so that you don't get familiar and get comfortable with these people here yet a new group you might get someone who does look sternly or who uh, asks questions which you can't grasp because the questioner himself is so confused he can't put a confused question you have to work with that you might say could you restate that please or find some way to comment it so it would be helpful to everyone yes I was in Ruby's class and my jolt was seeing myself as wanting to be that blabbermouth and stopping it good yes and waiting for his comments yes that's good work yeah breaking the train of mechanical habit aside from myself and looking at myself as what I would normally want to do in that situation yeah and not doing it right I gained from that right that's good self work any other comments? Yes, go ahead. I had the most astounding experience in our group. Sally gave us this assignment, as Dick pointed out, speak slowly. And all of a sudden, I felt my face turning red. When it was yeah. my turn. I don't know why. I'm not embarrassed to speak in front of people, but it just happened. And I don't, it was so uncomfortable. Oh. But I was able to observe it. It worked out beautifully in that respect. Her little project, to repeat it in case some of you didn't know, was to, and I will illustrate it from this point on, of making everyone speak, act, gesture, rub their forehead with slow speed in order to make yourself observe yourself as you habitually are because only by doing the unfamiliar can you see its opposite and so we all all tried this a little bit and it was a very interesting experiment which you could try with yourself throughout the day this comes under the heading of simply changing your pace so that you can see yourself in another light and you may catch yourself speaking things that you thought were profound which are nonsensical There's so many things try it for yourself sometime I asked her to speak up loud because she speaks very soft and low she's going to have to go to the opposite of this now and speak as a loud mouth see and the loud mouth has to learn to speak softly and quietly go to the opposite so we can observe we never see the familiar we are it identified with it one comments on classes Sitting in the group, in the other room, I heard a group in here, which she must have been part. I suddenly heard the coming down in everything, and I heard someone say, let's hear you laugh, slow speed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wasn't paying attention as much as I should in my group, my group, I was listening to the also. Right. One, he was sitting in your class, participating in that one. <laughs> It was too loud. They were too loud about it. There's the one who let it. Talk to her. That's why everyone had to stay uh, after class at once. That's why it was the last one to break up. Correctly. As I went from class to class, I was seeing many things. Seeing how when you get certain groups of people, depending on the people you get together, the atmosphere is quite different. There's a world of difference in the atmosphere between Sally's class and yours. Your class was heavy, hers was light. That doesn't necessarily mean there wasn't learning, there was learning in all of them. But this one was going on at a much lighter pace. People were more relaxed in it. Your class was more tense, whoever you had in your. This is not criticism. Don't take anything as criticism for heaven's sake. You should know better about it. Yes? I recognized an unfamiliarity uh, pattern, mechanical, hearing voices out there. And then all of a sudden, everything was down there it arrested my attention it was different yes so right different. right that's an example of how we see something that is different all of a sudden it changes remember the story the story of the man who uh, worked in a factory where all noise bang bang hammers going on and steam wheels is going inside he lived in a terrible noisy factory worked in a noisy factory you could hardly stand it and all of a sudden the power broke down and everything became deadly silent he looked around and he said, what's that? 
<laughs> the difference. Yes. Well, last night I don't know the noise through or the different different groups, but yeah, you can use that as as a shock to keep your attention in your own group. Right. Yeah. That'd be a work project. Yeah. Yeah. Try to pay attention to something, not just to. Like the lawnmower yesterday. Yeah, bringing it back here. Yeah. Yes. It, it came to me while we were sharing, and Sally shared an experience or a work project she was conducting on herself concerning her her mechanical smiling. Yeah. And I was reminded because I had observed Sally the first few hours we were together, and I thought Sally seems very somber to me, very somber, and it almost became a judgment, a critical judgment on my part. And then when she shared that she's working so very hard to eliminate mechanical planning, then I realized we should never, we should be extremely alert to our judgments that we pass, especially on people in work or who are working. Yes. Because we don't know what their work project is. Right. So we must be very yeah. cautious because this is a, an extreme danger. Yes. Yeah. Quite correct. We don't know what they're working on. I saw one yesterday get up up away from a table of familiar faces and go into another room and talk with someone. I forgot who it was. I don't know. I was just curious as whether he was working on himself or not to put himself away from this and go in to talk to someone else. Right? right? I was in my class last night with Mary Cassidy. Barbara. How did you feel? I jolted you last night. I told you you haven't even started, you haven't begun to work yet. And also, the church, my own reaction to it. Put myself in a very uncomfortable position. You put yourself in an uncomfortable right. position and by jolting right. them a little bit? Right. Yes, because you don't know how they're going to react to that. Right. Or, you know, for example, you want to say, for example, I don't know, they might have thought that you were be doing this in imitation or doing it mechanically yourself, and you were wondering if they were going to maybe see this. If you were, I don't know, you judge. So there's all kind of things involved. Yes? You did not appear uncomfortable from my observation. Yes? Yes, right. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> well, I have to say for myself, though, and I'll, I'll speak a little bit. For the first time our group went to Boulder City, you said something like that. And uh, my first reaction was, well, you know, how does he know? And uh, then we was able to begin to observe my feeling of criticism was really coming from me. And I'm sure, and I, a couple of others shared that they had the same feeling. And you tried to experiment on us, too, with uh, with Rudy, I believe, that he was uh, late, that made us feel a little uncomfortable. I understand, yes. And, uh, but this, these are great. This yeah, That's why I think yeah. it's so great that we uh, have got uh, people that are working on themselves that will come in to our experience and jolt us because we need it very bad. We've, look how we've completely reversed it. This is what just what you said. All our lives up to a certain point, we did everything possible to avoid getting upset, finding our secure little corners, surrounding ourselves with people who think and believe as we do. Everything possible to feel secure, all the time being scared, right? Now we're doing the exact opposite. What a shock, but we're doing it. We're deliberately putting ourselves, exposing ourselves to looking foolish, to being humiliated, to seeing how wrong we are and always were. The very opposite. Yes? We are still putting ourselves in a group that agrees with you. You with your group the, and us with our group. That does what? That agrees? That agrees with us. Well, agreement in the truth is not an attempt to find security. We simply see it. If, if, if I really know the truth and she does, 
This is not dependency. This is truth. What? What? Depends on what you're agreeing on. If you and I agree that we should uh, go out and conquer the world, that's a neurotic agreement. What are you agreeing on? And you remember what I said before? When you are really in a, this lady and I are in agreement on the truth. There's no division between us. We don't get together and plot and let's say, let's believe this certain thing about the truth. That is thought. When we really agree on the truth, no words are necessary. We don't even think about whether we're in agreement or not. I think what I meant was that we would get more jolts from people outside our group than we would within the group. Get all the jolts you can wherever you can get them. No. In, out. Yes. In, the Volga, in our group, I know we certainly get jolted. If I'm late, I, I'm told about it. Whatever we do that is not right, we're told about it. So we're jolted. It's really not a comfortable little uh, group. It's jolt, jolt, jolt. As much as we can take. Yes. And the more you take, the more you will be able to take in the future. Uh, yes. Yeah. This idea too that uh, we should, we get jolts, uh, you know, in the groups that we work in. But boy, for heaven's sake, if we're if we're not getting jolts out in the world, mm -hmm. that we're not working where we really should be working. Right. Which is yeah. where it's really at. We're only in the groups a little while. Right. That's right. Really got to work out. That car mechanic is your best friend. He really is. He doesn't know it. Now you know it. He's helped. Oh, he helped you. Oh, thank heaven. This morning in a play, coming or yesterday, whatever, someone, what are you doing this weekend? We're going to a class. Then we say, what if they ask us what class? It isn't the Dick Pulte. It isn't the Vernon Howard. It isn't the JLS. Group, to me, this is not a group. We are just people. We are just people. This, a that, a anything else. It's just people in come a little while, we all go poof with our own self in our own place. Yes, well, I think maybe what you're saying, that it's hard to really describe what we're doing here, the other person. When someone comes to our group or is going to come for the first time, I, I pass the ball to Joan because I know how difficult it is to explain to anyone what it's all about. And I just tell her, just use your own words as best you can, which they're not going to grasp anyway. Even if you simplify it to as simply as you can to say, well, we're a self-study group. We're trying to change our lives. Already on the phone, for example, there are associations that say, oh, that's right. I used to go to Alcoholics Anonymous or Neurotics Anonymous, or I read that book where we try to change it. See, you do the best you can. Then when they come, <laughs> they'll know what it's all about, if they come. Copyright 1973. No portion of this material may be reproduced or sold without permission from Bruno Associates, Garden Grove, California.